people all who Christina is. Christina is a photographer and an inventor who, like many of us, left the corporate life in 2018, sold all her stuff, went to travel the world, and that's where she realized, okay, this is where I found my calling. I love photography. Um, I'm going to start photographing landscapes, uh, photographing people, and she's become almost a, a professional at it. So now she's going to share her knowledge with us. Today, she runs um, her own website and an Etsy shop as well, where she does some digital prints. And she's going to tell us more about her business and what she has to offer and teach us how to get started in improving your travel photography. So Christina, you may have the floor. Thank you so much, Leah. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Let me share my screen uh, with you all. Hold on one moment. Let's see. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Well, I am so excited to be here. Um, thank you so much to Leah for the introduction and to Erica and the Nomadic Network. Um, I joined the Nomadic, just a little bit first about the Nomadic Network. I joined the Nomadic Network about a year ago. And it was when I, Leah said, Leah mentioned that I went on a year long trip around the world. Uh, perfect timing. I got back a year ago before COVID hit. And about a week before I got back from my trip, I was a little nervous, to be honest, to return to Boston, return to my life here. And, um, you know, I made a great group of uh, friends along the road on my trip around the different parts of the world. And I was nervous about, you know, I was coming back to Boston. I had a few friends that liked to travel, but no nobody that had ever kind of experience what I experienced or been to places that I experienced. Or to be honest, wanted to listen to my travel stories or my past year. So about a week before I was coming back to Boston, I um, Nomadic Matt, who I follow on Instagram and Facebook, as I'm sure many of us do, uh, posted a story about this new community coming up, the Nomadic Network, and they were looking for uh, different volunteers. And so I, was so excited. They were opening a chapter in Boston. And so I got responded right away, volunteered to, um, you know, lead some of the events in Boston. And two weeks later, a week later, I was back in Boston. And a week after that, Erica and I were meeting for lunch in Boston. And the first Nomadic Network event was that night. Um, and I knew right away, these were you know, my people, people that kind of understood that travel bug, the, the wanting to explore and wander and kind of the rest is history. Um, so I found a great group of people in Boston and uh, now with the, uh, you know, all the events online, it's been great to connect with people around the world. So, uh, so I encourage you to keep coming to the events <laughs> and it's been really um, wonderful for myself and, and expanding my network. So just a little bit about myself um, and kind of my travel photography journey. So as Leah mentioned, I didn't, uh, you know, quit my job, sold most everything I owned and went on a year long trip after working in the corporate world for about a dozen years. And um, during this time, this travel around the world, I thought, what do I want to really experience? What do I want to do? What do I want to, you know, accomplish during this year? And one thing that I had dabbled in before was photography. Um, you know, I didn't really know too much about how to use my camera yet or like how to get these great epic shots, um, but I knew I wanted to delve more into it. And so with, you know, the year around the world, I had a 45 liter backpack on my back. And part of that was a camera I had just bought a week before, three lenses, and I picked up some more photography gear along the way. And so during that year, I took, um, I just took a look tonight. This presentation has had me uh, going back into all my photos, which has been so nice, but I took over 25,000 shots in those, in that year, um, which is looking back crazy. <laughs> like, I had my camera with me all the time and I constantly took shots in the beginning. They weren't, you know, what I wanted or hoped for, but it co constantly kind of improved throughout it. And I did some, you know, I to um, learn a little bit about photography. I did different courses and read different blogs. And to be honest, just a lot of um, experimenting what worked, what didn't work. And that's what I want to share with you all tonight is I'm going to share eight different tips. Um, I had to kind of cull it down a little bit. 
but eight different tips that I think could make a difference in your um, travel photography that I have found made a difference for myself. And, um, you know, no fancy camera required, although, you know, if you are looking to upgrade your camera, I can recommend, um, uh, you know, gear and everything. And I'll send that out in an email afterwards if you would like to sign up for that. Um, but, you know, no fancy camera is required for any of these tips. Um, you know, iPhones are great or a big fancy DSLR is great too, but none of them are required for these to transform your travel photography. So let's uh, delve right in. And I think as, uh, as Erica and Leah mentioned, if you do have questions, drop them in the chat. Um, Leah and Erica will go through them and we'll get through some of them after the presentation. All right, all right. So first tip that I have, and this has been really changing in my photography is lighting and time of day, right? So uh, a lot of people say photography is like painting with light, right? So the time of day really does make a difference for your um, photography. And so the best time of day for photography is really early in the morning or just before sunset, right? So an early in the, about an hour after, there is something called a golden hour in, photo in uh, lighting, right? It's an hour after sunset and about an hour, an hour after sunrise and about an hour after sunset as well. And so during this time, like everything I think transforms. So the mo most mundane, like um, normal thing can transform during this time, I think. So take a look at this. We have, this is in uh, Lake Bled in Slovenia and their boats tied up to a dock, right? On the lake. Um, but I think these are transformed with the lighting during golden hour, right? They can become almost magical. They almost glow, right? And during the middle of the day, I don't think this happens, right? It's, you get like very harsh, especially depending on the time of the year and where you are in the world. But during the middle of the day, you get really, really harsh, usually sunshine. So the worst time of photography is during the middle of the day. Um, so either in the morning, or in the evening, you get this kind of beautiful golden light, long shadow. So again, almost the most normal things can become super, super beautiful. Sunset. I mean, we all have seen amazing sunsets, but again, transformative with the lighting and the time of day, it's like magic happens. This is a sunset just north of Boston, um, a place called Plum Island. They, uh, how to pull over for the shot. <laughs> and again, just showing, this is taken in Tuscany. We all know, we're all have seen pictures of beautiful Tuscany. And this is a pretty normal shot, right? You have a, a grapes on a vine, but really I believe what is kind of transformative about this is that golden sunshine coming through, right? And this was taken just before sunset. I took a walk, staying at a hostel nearby, took a walk through, um, uh, the vineyards and kind of came upon this shot. And then, you know, another benefit of this time of day. So I was in Italy for a month last August and, um, you know, exploring Italy in August is pretty crowded. <laughs> so I made it a point to get up before sunrise and get out of the door before sunrise every morning. And I am not a morning person. Um, but a benefit is no one was at the Coliseum when I went. Right, and so this is about 6.30, right after the sun rose. No one was there and, uh, you know, I got this and other shots of the Coliseum with no one else in them. And so, you know, I think that's just a travel tip in general that I have found worked out really well for my trip is get up early and out the door before all the other travelers come out, especially when it's the crowded time of year. An hour and a half after this shot was taken, there were hundreds if not thousands of people in this exact spot. Another tip that I have for uh, to transform your photography is context and depth, adding them to your image. And there's a few ways to do this. This is a sunset in San Diego. And you know, you've seen, we've all seen beautiful photos of sunset over the West Coast. And you know, I myself have taken so many photos of just the sun setting over the ocean right? But how can you add more context into the image so that when you go back to the image, you see like where it was taking, you can almost put yourself right there, standing at the end of this alley, looking over to the, um, looking over into the beach and watching the sunset. I think you also get the context of, you know, the place as well, seeing this golden glow. This was again, 
golden hour right before the sun sets. See the palm trees, just adding more context and more of the foreground into the image. This is a lake in, uh, in California. And um, I think, you know, this was after a hike, got to this beautiful lake. I think it was called Mirror Lake and seeing this beautiful reflection. The first instinct might be to take an image just of, you know, the water and the trees behind it, right? But how can you place yourself more in the, in the image, in the picture? And I think for this, what works successfully is having this foreground in it, right? Having these rocks in it. And so when I um, am taking a, a photo, particularly of a landscape, I like to see how can I place more of the foreground in the image so it's not just like what I see out there, right? When we are traveling, um, you know, so often you go to these amazing expansive places and you come back with the photos and you're like, wait, there was so much more to that, right? So I think bringing in more of the place through some of the foregrounds um, helps. So you have different layers. So you have the foreground of the rocks, the middle ground of the lake, and the background of the um, mountains back here. And I think that just helps to place yourself back in that spot. And this is another photo of Lake Bled, the, where the um, beautiful boats were at um, Golden Hour. Definitely a different view of the lake. We have, um, if any of you have been to the Lake Bled or seen beautiful images of Lake Bled, you see this beautiful, um, you know, uh, island in the middle of the lake, which is unbelievable. I, um, for this image, I really liked adding some of the foreground. And for this, it's the restaurant here on the right. Um, you can see some of the textures here. Um, I think for me, this helps bring me back into that moment a little bit more where I was just surrounding me in addition to my view. Another great way to do that is kind of trees in the, in the foreground, really anything that you can bring to bring your back so you can have the viewer see where they are right now, if that makes any sense. And again, another example of this, this is in uh, California and uh, Torrey Pines, uh, north of San Diego. And again, bringing in some of the foreground of this dirt down here, the plants up here, so you can really put yourself in the image rather than taking an image just of maybe the beach and the water, right? How can you bring the viewer and yourself back in the photo through a little bit more context and depth? So for this image, we have the foreground of these plants and the dirt, the middle ground of the beach and the water, and then the background, we have these cliffs back here. Um, and I think that just helps to bring the whole image together. And one more, um, this is from a, um, a long boat, is it a two day long boat ride in Laos. And on this long boat ride down the river there, uh, you go by these amazing little villages um, that you could only get to from this long boat or from the river. And, you know, they were incredible, but just taking a photo of just kind of the middle is kind of a flat image, right? How can you add more context? So on the right here, you see the curtain from the boat, right? Um, you can see a bar from the boat. Um, so how can you add more context, right, to the image so you can see where the viewer is? So you can almost put yourself back in that photo. And just one more example I have of this is, uh, this is a lighthouse just north of Boston in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And this is a great example of the different depths to have to the image, right? So in the bottom of the image, we have these rocks in the foreground that brings you into the space. In the middle on the right, we have um, this uh, building right? And that's uh, the middle ground. In the background, on the left, we have the lighthouse, right? So there's three different kind of depths to this or planes to it, which helps bring the viewer, I believe, back into the space. So to build off that context, um, one uh, is composing, composing a photograph, right? And so one really popular way to do that, and one thing that I have found really successful is the rule of thirds. 
So, so often when we're taking a photograph of a person or of a landscape, we tend to put what we think is the most important thing right in the middle of the photo. But a lot of times that's not, um, I don't believe the most compelling, right? There's so much more to the story than just in the middle of the photo. So going back to this image of um, this lighthouse, right? If we look at how it was actually composed, and when I say composed, I mean where the different elements are in um, uh, the photograph, which helps make it successful, we can divide the view in thirds on each side, right? So you have um, uh, thirds on each side with these lines. And some of the camera, and, and if you have like um, a DSLR mirrorless camera, there is a way on many of them to like have this show up in your viewfinder if you're just getting used to this concept. So what this is, the concept behind it is, so where the um, lines intersect, these four corners is, is a, you know, a, a guide to put like some of the more important things there. Also where they divide, lower, middle, and upper, and left, middle, and right, it's a good idea to put different elements in each one so that the center is not always the most important. And so for this image, you'll see this, um, this building is almost right along where um, the intersection of that is, right? This lighthouse is almost around where the intersection of um, these lines are. And the bottom third are the rocks in the foreground and the upper third is a sky. And so when you divide up this photograph, it helps to bring the eye around the image to make it a little more interesting rather than keeping everything kind of just in the, mi the middle, like having the, um, the lighthouse just in the middle. Another example of this, um, this is a little baby and uh, her mother who I came across at a market in Cambodia. Um, they were sitting in the back of a tuk-tuk and I couldn't pass by without grabbing an image. So I asked them if I can grab an image of them. Um, and so the way this is composed, if we look at the rule of thirds, right? So the left side we have, and we talk about context, we have a little bit of context of the tuk-tuk and we have the line dividing it in the left third. The woman's face almost, almost exactly where um, the crosshairs are of these two lines. And the baby's um, face right along almost where the, um, the line is up here. So trying to avoid putting people right in the center of a photograph to help add some context to it. Here is another image. This is from a temple in Cambodia. And we came upon this guy. He was um, making these bracelets and blessing people in this template and just his his face and his energy was so captivating um, and so I had to had to capture this right and so when we look at the composition of this um, you know I think it's easy to put him right in the middle but there's so much else to happening around here as far as building in some of the context of this so you'll see if we divide up, right, um, his face is kind of near that the intersection of those two lines and his hands down here um, are kind of near the bottom third. And then on the right side, right, um, having the, the hallway of this temple helps add context where he is um, and the space that surrounds him and helps to really move around the, the image. All right. So one more thing, another thing to build upon, and I know I'm going through it this uh, fairly quickly, uh, but these are things that could definitely make an impact. And um, at the end, I'm gonna share, um, if you wanna share your email address, I'm gonna send out all of these tips and a few more that I was not able to include on this presentation. So I can share that with you. So perspective. So, so often, so this is at Joshua Tree National Park in uh, California. And so often we go to these incredible expansive places, right? I, I'm sure we've all been to these places and take this gorgeous view and you get back and you're like, I swear it was bigger, right? I swear it was more expansive than that. Like it felt different. So adding some sort of context or 
almost size perspective to the photo helps with that. And so for this one, I was on a solo road trip through California and uh, no one else was around. So uh, I decided to set up my tripod, set up the camera and I put myself in the image. And so I believe when you put people in the image, people, you know how like around how big people are, right? Um, so it helps to kind of give perspective to the size of anything else around it. So you can about see how about how rocks, how large these boulders are um, through this. And I think also when, especially if it's a uh, kind of an anonymous person as well, like not the face showing, it kind of shows, um, helps the viewer to imagine themselves in the photo, right? Here's another great example. So this is uh, the Eastern Sierra in California. Again, on this solo road trip, I uh, happened to have another, this was right after sunrise. <laughs> Again, I remember peeling myself out of um, my tent that morning. And, um, you know, coming upon this, you see the, you know, you see the expansive view, um, but seeing this person down here in kind of the center of the photograph. I believe it was another photographer that happened to be there. Um, I believe it helps to add a little bit of context, how big this place was, how expansive this place is, right? So what are things that we can add into our images that you know people know about the size of? I found people to be successful. You can do cars, um, buildings, stuff like that, but just adding to, um, to show, right? The expansiveness of a landscape. Couple more images, so um, to showcase this. So they're actually kind of, um, didn't realize this until I was putting together this presentation, but these two images are actually fairly, fairly similar in composition, right? The left is from San Diego um, at sunset and, uh, you know, looking over the pier and a surfer happened to be there and ended up being kind of the perfect shot. And the right is uh, in Massachusetts, in North Shore of, Bos of Boston in, um, at sunset and uh, a fisherman on a kayak happened to be there. So again, putting people in perspective, I think helps to make it more interesting. Um, and especially if they're kind of more anonymous looking people helps to bring the viewer into that space and kind of experience what um, you were able to experience. And one last example on this, this is um, the Dolomites in Northern Italy, which are, oh my, absolutely incredible. Um, <laughs> I just remembering back there, there's almost like no way of capturing the beauty and expansiveness of a place like this, right? But again, bringing in, so you'll see in this image a few things, right? The foreground you'll see in the bottom right, right? Help to bring in where, where this image was taken. You'll see kind of the rule of thirds as you go down, you see the bottom third is the, is the ground, the middle third is the mountain, the upper third is the um, sky. So bringing in that composition. And then if you look at the bottom left, you see this building and this was a refuge where you could, hikers could stay overnight and grab food there. Um, and you'll see if you look really closely, some of these people down here, super, super small, right? So that helps to having that in the image helps to add perspective of how grand and expansive these mountains are behind and how big this space is. Um, and I think without that, it's really hard to tell how big this place is, right? And it's hard to put yourself there because of that. And another tip I have is get a new view, right? This has helped me. So when I went to Barcelona, this was the first view I saw of, I just snapped this photo, the first view I saw of the uh, cathedral there. It's amazing, they're, they're building it. They've been building it for so many years. And so, I mean, this is fine, but how can you see this in a different way, right? You can get up close to it um, and adding some, again, um, perspective to it, like the cranes, because they're still building it, right? It adds a whole different view or get up high and far away, right? So you'll see the cathedral sticking out from the whole downtown, which I think is incredible. This is um, uh, 
I actually contacted a, uh, someone who lived, a photographer who lived in Barcelona um, right before this, and I loved his photos. And I saw a similar photo of his, and I said, "Hey, where would you suggest?" And he actually brought me on a at sunrise. He brought me on a motorbike uh, or scooter ride on the back of a. I got on the back of a scooter, met him for the first time, and he brought me to all these amazing spots in the city. And this is one he brought me to. Um, so you'll see kind of a new perspective of the cathedral that looks totally different than the other two images. So getting, how can you get different views? Another example of this is this was snapped in uh, Vietnam. So again, at sunrise <laughs> theme here, um, there is a um, outside of Hoi An in Vietnam, there is a uh, fisherman come in every morning. There's a fisherman fish market. Um, mostly for the locals. I went on a, um, a actually photo tour there and uh, and it's mostly just for the locals and fisher fishermen come in and they bring their catch and they sell them at this market right in the morning, right after sunrise because they're fishing all night. So this woman was coming in on this interesting looking boat and I snapped this photo real quick down by the water and then I um, looked over and I saw that there was kind of a um, almost like a ledge up a little bit higher. And so I went up there and I got this image, right? And so it helps to simplify the photo. And so uh, another example of this, so once they bring the fish in and they're selling it in the village, we see scenes like this, where the woman is, she's eating her breakfast because it's early morning and she's selling the catch, right? That the fisherman caught that day. This is a pretty busy image, right? It's hard to focus on one thing. There's a lot, lot going on. So you think about how can you change your perspective on this, right? So this simplifies it. Um, you're seeing kind of, you know, it's getting all the, the, all the clutter out of there and it's simplifying it through a new perspective. So one thing I was challenged is, you know, how can you, yes, you can see this thing that, you know, everyone is over here snapping this photo of the, in one way, but can you think of different ways to do it, right? Can you think of different perspectives of either, you know, that cathedral or, you know, something as simple as a fisherman market? Like how can, how can it be, how can you see it a little bit different and help to simplify the image and really the focus of what you're trying to capture? All right, so going on, <laughs> getting off the beaten path and wandering. So this has been key to me. When I first um, started on my trip getting into photography, I would Google search best photography spots of Rome, best photography spots, you know, oh gosh, Sicily or wherever, Vietnam. And that was awesome. And I'd meet like 50 other photographers getting the same shot, right? But wandering, I'm a big wanderer. <laughs> so wandering and walking kind of off that beaten path and meeting new people and maybe spots that weren't kind of on Google um, have been really key for my own photography journey. So an example of this, so I was in Positano in Italy. Again, this was last August, super busy. So many tourists there. I decided to take a bus out to, uh, where did I go? I went to uh, Amalfi, the town of Amalfi on the Amalfi coast. And then I started walking along because all the towns there are all lined up on the coast. So I started walking down the main road and I came upon this town called that was looked very sleepy and quiet called the Trani. Beautiful town right on the beach, super, super quiet, small village. Didn't look like anyone else was really walking around. It was again, I was there early. And uh, on the left, you can kind of see one of the little hidden walkways that I came upon. And I went down that walkway and around the corner and didn't meet anybody. <laughs> and then I came to kind of the town center and there were a couple of you know, gentlemen having coffee and it seemed like kind of mostly locals. And I peered my head in to this open door because I'm a pretty curious person. And I came upon the scene on the right. And that was pretty intriguing to me. I love the textures on the wall and I was just kind of peeking in. And this guy in the center, he motioned for me to come inside and it happened to be that he was a sculptor and, and uh, pretty well known in the area for sculpting. Um, and so this was his workshop and we communicated through, uh, I knew very little Italian and he knew very little English. And so we communicated through 
pointing and smiling and it was just a wonderful conversation and I asked him if I can capture this image of him um, which I think kind of at least what, from what I got captures a little bit of his essence in that workshop and um, in his studio so really what and I wouldn't have if I googled this would have never come up I wouldn't have seen this in the guidebooks but wandering and get, kind of getting off the beaten path one other example of this is when I was in uh, Cambodia, I ended up in a, it was a nomad, um, nomad fishing village on the edge of the city. And they conduct, they put together these structures and as, um, and as the water rises in different times of the year, they move the structures up and then put them back down um, closer to the river. And so I was wandering through, the people were super friendly and so um, I came upon these scenes, these people. And so I asked, asked to capture their photo. Again, very little uh, actual like verbal words were exchanged. It was mostly through, um, you know, smiling, I think, and, um, you know, pointing to my camera and asking if I can capture their photo. And you can tell pretty quickly if someone is open to it or not. And then uh, I always tried afterwards to also show show them their image on the back of the, the, the camera. And it's amazing, their eyes light up. The, this little boy on the left, he was the friendliest, most animated little boy. Um, and when he saw the image on the back of the camera, his eyes light up and he was so happy and asked to capture like another photo. And it was just such a, such a joy. And uh, I love the expression of this, uh, this woman on the right. And so I guess the, the lesson here is don't be, you know, don't be scared to get off the beaten path and wander a little bit and see what you find. Maybe you'll find nothing, um, but maybe you'll find kind of beauty in kind of the most unexpected places. And so getting to kind of the cameras, right? So I, um, often people ask me like, what camera do you suggest and what gear do you suggest? And I, you know, I have suggestions for that, which I can, I happy to send out uh, my suggestions for that. But I truly believe the best camera is the one that you will carry around and that you know how to use, right? So, oh uh, gosh, it was probably like five years ago, I went and traveled and I went to Costa Rica and I was just getting into photography. And so I had this big DSLR camera with this big lens and you know I brought it in my, uh, in my travel gear, in my suitcase. And you know, that stayed in my backpack and my suitcase most of the trip because it was so heavy so bulky. When I was hiking, the last thing I wanted to do was um, take it out from the back of my backpack if I even had it with me. Um, so I didn't capture very many photos that trip. Uh, before I left on my year-long travels, I ended up investing in uh, a mirrorless camera, which is uh, fairly, fairly new uh, in the last few years. And they're lighter, they're smaller, more compact. I invested in some lenses that were more compact. Um, along my trip, I picked up a tripod because I wanted to capture some um, long exposures. And the tripod I picked up, I ended up getting like a lightweight one that actually fits in the cup holder on the back of, on the side of my backpack. Um, so for that, like I carried around my camera all day, right? And so I, I almost every day. And so I did capture a ton of uh, images on my trip. So if you are willing to carry around a big camera, awesome, more power to you and, and uh, get it. But if you are not willing to camera any camera, that's fine too. And um, iPhones and phones take amazing pictures now. So, you know, I think, you know, investing in it, thinking about like how you're gonna use it and how you're gonna carry it around before investing and bringing along, you know, a big camera on your trip. And then knowing how to use it, right? A big camera is kind of useful, useless if you really don't know the ins and outs of the settings and how to use it. So making sure that you are practicing before you go. Um, I didn't do this. I bought my camera a week before I left. So I kind of figured it out on the road. But, you know, in the beginning of my, um, my travels, I was like kind of frustrated that I didn't really know how to use it. And then after a while, figuring out kind of ins and the outs. Um, you know, really does make a huge, huge difference on the photos that you can capture. So if you're frustrated that you think your camera can't capture great photos, learn more, I think about the settings would be my opinion. And then shoot often, right? So I mentioned in the beginning that I took 25,000 photos on my trip. Um, 
which is crazy. And, um, but you know, all of that shooting, like all those images do not look like the images I just shared with you at all. And so the more you shoot, the better you get, right? So if you are going out shooting and you're frustrated that like 10, you shoot 10 images and they're not great, keep shooting, right? So like anything in life, the more you practice, the better you get at. So, and that is kind of the eight tips. And I'd love to, um, I do have more tips. <laughs> I'd love to share with you guys. Um, I think Erica or Lee are going to pop this in the chat, but I have um, a link that you can sign up for emails and I'll be sending out specifically the tips from this presentation along with a few more tips I have. And I'll also be sending out um, to that email uh, some gear suggestions. If you do want to, you know, it's gear that I worked, worked well for me on my trip and carrying around and kind of using every day. And I'd be happy to send those along. Um, so you can just click on them and, and get them if you'd like and check them out in the email. And then, you know, I'd love to connect with all of you. Um, on, I'm on Instagram mostly. Um, you can see me at instagram.com slash christina.sim. Um, shoot me a, a message. I'd love to connect, hear about your travel photography journey, any way that I can help. And then I do have my website there as well, christinasimphoto.com. And um, if you are interested, I do have prints for sale of all the images that I shared and, and more. So uh, that is all my presentation. I'm, I don't know if any um, questions came in, but I'll shoot it back to Leah and uh, we can answer all, get all your questions answered. Thanks everyone. No, we have no questions. I'm just kidding, Christina. You have a <laughs> billion questions. <laughs> Could you imagine? Everyone's like, that's great. Thanks. No. Thanks. Oh, that's um, <laughs> I, you have so many great questions and I came up with a few as well. So I always get these organized um, so that awesome. I can start from the beginning. So yeah, I do want to start with, because I like to, for topics like these, I like to bucket them. So this was fantastic. Your photography is absolutely mind blowing. Everyone go follow her on Instagram right now. Hit follow. <laughs> um, but Christina, how did you like educate yourself on this photography? Like, did you take any courses or lessons or YouTube videos? Like what inspiration did you use? Like what else did you use to supplement your actual practice of going out? And yeah, absolutely. All? So I, um, you know, I, I, I did a lot of different blogs. Um, there is a, uh, you know, I just kind of, as I, as I kind of encountered something that I wanted to, you know, get the move past, I guess I looked at different blogs. There is a great, um, Nomadic Matt actually used to have a travel photography course, which I did sign up for and took and went through and, um, went through on the lessons for, and that was super helpful as kind of a base for that. Um, I'm not sure if it's still on nomadic mat but uh and yeah as i went when i was like how do i to be honest i used a lot of google <laughs> figured it out and watch a lot of youtube hey, i don't have specific, for, right <laughs> yeah i didn't don't have um uh there is a couple of youtube channels uh i can't think of the name off of but i can send those out as well um but yeah, as I kind of encountered something, I just kind of Googled it and figured it out. And okay. uh, again, like shooting more helped me so much. Yeah, of course, like trial and error, getting out there, testing things out, right? Right. Um, Erica, everyone in the chat just dropped uh, the travel photo course that Christina went through. So you can use that link. Um, Erica also dropped in the chat where you can find and connect with Christina. So do it right now. Like I said, like do it 10 minutes ago. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. That is awesome. So it was really like an amalgamation of everything. Plus you went through a course and that's, right. that's, uh, that's great to hear. Okay. So now I want to get into a bit of gear. Um, I know some people had piped up in the chat, but like what's the difference between a DSLR and a mirrorless? Yeah, the mirrorless, so a DSLR has, um, the way it works is kind of traditional. It has a mirror inside of it. Uh, and mirrorless doesn't. It's just the way the, the photo is taken. So um, mirrorless is a lot lighter and smaller than a DSLR. It's, uh, they've okay. progressed it so that it is what? like, the quality okay. is just as good. What, I didn't realize there was like a mirror in a, in a big camera. Yeah, yeah, there's a mirror that takes, it's kind of the traditional way that a photo is taken. 
Um, so the, the mirrorless is just like, it's the same quality as a DSLR um, okay. and sometimes better, but it uh, has no mirror in it. So it's like smaller, less bulky. Um, I think way better for traveling just because it doesn't have that bulk right. and size that a, a DSLR has. Is it less expensive also generally? Not necessarily. <laughs> not yet. No. Um, because I think there's different right. technology that goes, it's not like it's just the mirrorless is taken away. I think there's different technology that goes into it that makes it just the quality just as good as mm. uh, the full um, DSLR camera. Okay, All right. So, okay, do you mostly use a standard lens or a telephoto for your pictures? I'm sorry, Brian had that question in Janet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so the, the three lenses I think I brought on my... Um, trip. I have a 16 to 70, which is a telephoto. It's kind of all around lens. And that's what I keep on my camera most of the time. I do also have a um, wide angle lens that I love for like landscapes. That was a 12 meter millimeter that I brought on my trip. And then I, uh, the third lens that I used was a, I think it was a 30 or I brought rather, it was a 35 millimeter. I honestly only use that a few times. Um, I would probably, if I were to, I, hauled it throughout my whole trip because it was kind of an investment so I didn't want to just drop it off you know in Vietnam right. when I realized I wasn't going to be using it um but I uh so I brought it throughout my trip but I only use it to be honest a handful of times so I would probably uh suggest kind of those two lenses if I were to do it again sure okay and then you have like um a backpack or messenger bag that like a nice one to protect all this gear while you're traveling as well yeah, I do. I have, well, I have kind of, um, I always brought it carry on. Like if I had to check my backpack, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I always brought my camera and gear kind of carry on just to make sure it didn't get rustled or anything. If it, if the other stuff did had to be checked. Sure. Um, I just have kind of a standard camera bag. And then one thing I would suggest is when I was hiking, I have kind of um, a holster for my, my camera so that if I'm hiking and I want to, or I wear it, I wore it all the time. It was just like, here, I'll show you. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> on tell. my backpack, I, uh, oh, it's just nice. something that clips onto the camera, right? So if I'm hiking, I clip it on. Hold on. I'll show you if we got the full thing here. Oh, and it nice. just stands, it just, it's just right there, right? So if I'm hiking or going around the city, my camera's always at hand. So if I see a shot I wanna take, I'm not taking off my backpack and it, like uh -huh. going through it, I just simply take it off, take the shot and put it right back on. That's incredible. Yeah, so um, that, would, that would be a huge uh, recommendation because sure. that was one of the big problems I had in Costa Rica is it wasn't always readily available. Right, like, you know, you're hiking up volcanoes and whatnot and visiting hot springs. <laughs> you're like, I want to take a photo. Yeah, exactly. Krista wants to know if that's Peak Design or like what brand that is or what brands you can recommend. I think it's Peak Design, um, but I'll take a look and I can send that out in the email as well with all the gear. Okay, cool. All right. And then I don't even know what this question means. Um, Andrew wants to know what your perspective is on whether to you re use a release or not. Oh, like a shutter release? Um, so, I mean, you is that what, Andrew, is that what you meant? Like a- No, it's a release nodding, for no. the kids and the people in your photos. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, I didn't even capture that. I have been told that if it's editor like it's a bit editorial and not commercial photography, you don't need a release. Um, I did look into that a little bit, but that's mm. what I've been, that's what I've been told. So I don't okay. sell the photos of people, people's faces. Right. Or anything. Well, okay. Let me piggyback off that with Susan just asked a question. Do you find that some of the people you photographed expect, um, like tips and return them for the photo or like, what is the, the protocol and the etiquette on this? In some countries they would like it. Um, so if, for example, I try not to necessarily pay for a photo because I don't know if that, um, I don't know, I don't feel great about that. But what I do, if like, if I'm taking a photo of someone in a shop, I'll buy something from their shop, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily, if someone comes up to me and was like, oh, I'll be in your photo for, you know, a few dollars, I don't usually do that. So. Right. Right. Do you ever, you know, I, I just thought of this as we were chatting because I know some people may not have internet access, but do you like ever 
either one stay in a country long enough to like give a printout of these photos to these people or like get their email address so you could send it to them. I think that'd be yeah. so cool I have if sent, people have them. Oh, totally. I have sent, um, I have gotten email addresses before and sent them their photo afterwards. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Which has been I really, like really that's nice. such a yeah, I mean, your and your like portraits are just incredible. So oh, I wouldn't not want to have that. <laughs> yeah. And it's really um, rewarding as well. I think I mentioned this before is like, um, to show them, even if it's on the back of the camera, to show them the photo afterwards, feel doesn't feel to me, it doesn't feel great just to take their photo and walk away. But right. to have an interaction right. and to kind of come back full circle and to show whoever you've captured their portrait, their photo on the back of their camera, people seem to really appreciate that and then open, yeah. open up even a little bit more. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, great, so that covers a lot of the gear questions. Let's move on to like the actual uh, work of doing it. Um, Melanie wants to know, do you currently like get paid for your travel photography? So I do sell some of my prints on um, online. I have a, a Etsy shop, so I do, um, you know, sell a few prints that way. Um, but I know I'm exploring different options as far as like it, it's a hard time for the travel <laughs> travel yeah. industry. But I'm exploring different options for kind of editorial photography and stuff like that currently. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm dropping your. I just dropped, dropped it. Oh, awesome. oh, okay. Well, both Erica and I dropped it. Click mine, <laughs> Thank everyone. You. Click mine. <laughs> Click my link. <laughs> <laughs> um, I every time you were talking about gear, I wanted you to be like, Christina, drop your link so we you can get credit. Like, drop your affiliate <laughs> link so we can click through and buy your products. <laughs> um, Ali wants to know: Do you have any advice on taking photos underwater? Ooh, you know what? That's something I really haven't done. Um, I have come across other people. I mean, it does definitely require special gear. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something I want to explore, but I have not done yet. So. Oh, do you have a GoPro or do you use I GoPro? do not. No, no. no. Okay. I know there's a way you can get like special casing for your like DSLR mm -hmm. or even like, you know, iPhone, obviously, or um, a special right. casing for your mirrorless cameras to like bring it underwater and have the outside flashes and stuff like that. But I haven't personally um explored that those are all in my memory I guess <laughs> all those. yeah um casing for your DSLR like getting casing for my GoPro was already like heart murmurs enough but yeah if anyone has casing for their DSLR drop that in the chat like I'm sure we'd love to know that oh yeah um but <laughs> it's okay I took my iPhone in a Ziploc bag in the Philippines and it worked just fine I don't recommend <laughs> it but like Always but a gamble. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the dive guide was, in, the snorkel guide was insistent on like, don't worry, it'll be fine. And oh, we'll, gosh. we got <laughs> two minute videos of clownfish. So. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> All right. So um, Steph wants to know what's your process for narrowing, narrowing photos down from a trip? Yeah, this is, this is, that's a hard one. Um, that's always sort of the hardest part of it. I, um, I personally use uh, Lightroom. So, and I, during my trip, I like tried to upload the photos every couple of days because like the thought of just doing it at the end was just crazy. So I'd always upload it. So I use Lightroom and they have like a star system in Lightroom. And I'm sure you can do other programs like this, but what I do is I go through all the photos and I, um, they have a five star system. So I attribute one star to anything that's in focus. Then I keep going through and like choose the best things. I go two stars and then from that group, I choose three stars and four stars. Oh. And then at the end, I'm left with um, just the five star ones. And for me, that helps because seeing them all together and just picking, you know, let's say out of um, 510 images, that seems a little overwhelming to me, but kind of calling them down a little bit at a time, for me, that works. Um, and it, again, that's in Lightroom, but I'm sure other programs have something similar to that. Right. Right, that's interesting. Um, I love that. Okay, I have to get into Lightroom. I feel like it's a bit intimidating <laughs> for me, but um, you're inspiring me now awesome. to get into it. <laughs> so um, Catalina wants to know, what website or platform do you recommend for storing your photos besides having external hard drives? And I can't even imagine how many external hard drives you have. <laughs> yeah, so I use some sort of, um, and I have to look up exactly what I use, but I, so I back up my photos uh, three ways. I do have the, um, 
external, like physical external hard drive. I have a cloud that it backs up into as well, a cloud hard drive. And then uh, I, for the most part, keep the, um, the SD cards that right. the photos are on as well. I don't kind of write over them. And so for me, that works. Um, uh, but I'm sure other people have different different ways. For me, that the traveling, especially the the physical external hard drive, and the cloud worked out great because sometimes internet access or internet wasn't great, and it would be really long time to upload like 500 images. It would take days in some of these places. So having a yeah. physical external hard drive worked out really really well, and um, yeah. and something I didn't necessarily think about kind of the speed of the internet in different places. Um, until I kind of encountered that and it would be like one photo in you know, three minutes. And so it would take a long time. <laughs> yep. Yep. That, that, absolutely. Um, Robert wants to know, do you have a smartphone and app of choice for photography on the go or what do you use? What was that? Sorry. Um, Robert wants to know if you have like a smartphone and your app of choice for photography on the go or, you know, what your preference is, what do you use every day? Yeah, I use, um, so I mostly use Lightroom. Um, they do have a smartphone app, which is really well, really good. Sometimes to be honest, if I'm just taking photos on my phone, I just use the, the photo editing app within, I have an iPhone. It just use a photo editing app within Apple. Um, what is it, Apple photos or whatever? But a uh, Lightroom on the go works out really well on the phone and also connects to, um, you know, your computer as well if you store it in the cloud. So that works out really well for me. Um, that's pretty much <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. I'm sure, uh, you know, a lot of people have their Androids and their iPhones. That's what they're starting on. So that's yeah. what people like to hear. Yep. Cool, cool. Um, so Sydney wants to know what are some of your tips for editing photos? Like, do you prefer a more natural look or a more edited look? You know, everyone has their preferences. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think also I, I try to make it as, um, I think with any photo, right? It's hard to get it exactly what it looked like at that time. Um, I try to get it as close as possible from what I remember that it looked like. And it does help to like, you know, edit them as soon as possible after you take it so that memory from your brain is, you know, transferred. Um, but yeah, I try to, I, for, I try to get them as for my own self, like, um, as natural as possible. Uh, but kind of, a have been told like some of my photos looks like, uh, paintings as well. So I don't know if that kind of comes through in some of them. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I do try to get it as natural as possible. I think when you're beginning to edit photos, I found for myself and I've found with other people, um, you tend to oversaturate them a little mm -hmm. bit and they become really saturated and don't look necessarily realistic. So toning that down a little bit, um, I have found, especially in my beginning photography has really, has really helped. And I can see kind of my progress and like, it's a little bit oversaturated in the beginning and now it has kind of a more natural look to it. Right. Um, yeah, your photography is incredible. It's like very, oh, I don't know what the word is. For me, it's like enlightening. It's just so like bright. Mm, and I thank feel you. like I'm like lifted out of the room. Okay, that sounds all Amazing. Thank you. you guys know what <laughs> thank I you for the endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need a testimonial, come to me. <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, well, I think that's unless anyone has any last minute questions. Um, Christina, you're awesome. just look staring at your presentation was wonderful. And I hope everyone here was inspired today. I think, you know, they all came to to learn from you. So we're super National Geographic there. Susan, oh. I was trying to think of it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Please nice. submit. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know Christina has been featured on every, every everyone Nomadic Mat, um, or Nomadic Network does um, like their feature Fridays. So you just have to tag um, a certain hashtag and then Matt Nomadic Matt will repost it. And I know Christina has been featured a few times as well as other great photographers in the chat right now. So yeah. Um, That's awesome. There's some great photographs on that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I can speak for everyone when I say that you are an inspiration to the rest of us. So thank, thank you for you. being here today and, awesome. and sharing well, all of your tips. Well, I had um, so oh, yeah. much Hashtag fun. Nomadic Network. What's up, yeah. I had so much fun. So thank you all for joining. I hope um, my presentation had value and um, the ways that you can 
easily kind of improve your photography and I'd love to connect. So I, uh, yeah. I know, um, the link has been in there to sign up. I'd love to send you the emails with the, um, with the context from the presentation tonight and additional tips that I have and the gear list. And then um, I'd love to connect with you guys on Instagram or and hear from you. So thank you very much. Christina's super active and very responsive on Instagram. So, um, you know, if we didn't get to your question here, uh, yeah. she could totally help you and connect with her, support her in um, all the links that we've dropped